and then what in higher dimensions? Well, in higher dimensions, there are many ways to think of Kleinian groups. One very important is to consider groups of conformal automorphisms of the uh, higher dimensional spheres, which is the same as asymmetries of hyperbolic space. But if we were interested in complex geometry, complex dynamic, that was not what we had in mind. So we started work working on discrete subgroups of PSL and C. And then our first question was if going into dimension more than one, there was anything interesting. And then we started working. Well, and that's uh, so I, it's a topic in which we've been working in Mexico for more than 20 years already. And uh, Ravis Pulcarnis, as you will see, his work has been fundamental for us. So let me start with the classical case where we consider PSL2C, so classical Kleinian groups. So we know we have this group of isomorphism between PSL2C, which can be seen as the group of modest transformations for the complex coefficients. It's also isometries of hyperbolic real to space. Is the group, the connected component of the identity of the group SO31, conformal automorphisms of S2, and also uh, is the group of very words of even length generated by inversions in circles. And then we have a analogous descriptions isomorphisms where we consider PSL2R. This is all well, well known, very beautiful. And uh, let me recall also that Poincaré, there was a Kleinian groups is a concept introduced by Poincaré, but he also classified the elements in PSL2C into elliptic, parabolic, and loxodromic transformations. There, were, there are many ways to give that classification. And uh, one of them, I, I give the one which is convenient for my lecture later on. And so and the elliptic is up to conjugation, it's just a rotation. Parabolic is just a translation. And the loxodromic is multiplication by a complex number of norm different to one. So by definition, a Kleinian group is a discrete subgroup of PSL2C. I must point out that in Poincaré's original definition, there was one further requirement. And it was that the group acts on the Riemann sphere in such a way that the, the, the limit set, which is the set of accumulation points of the orbits, is not everything. Or equivalently, in such a way that there's an open invariant set where the action is properly discontinuous. Nowadays, people call Kleinian group any discrete subgroup of PSL to C. And Are you changing of, slides? Sorry? Are you changing slides or not? Uh, so far, no. Uh, yes, okay. I'm changing. It is not changing for you? No. Oh, gosh. Uh, let's see. Yeah, OK. Now it is working, it seems. But in a small format, no? So you, you're changing my, but you're seeing my, my whole screen now. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah now so, it is working perfectly. Okay. Thanks for telling me. Okay, so some examples of Kleinian groups are exactly groups. So you take one element, and look at the cyclic group it generates. And for example, the, the, the previous classification can be given as follows. If we have an elliptic element or a group, an element is elliptic, then the limit set of the group it generates either is empty if the group is finite, if it is a finite rotation, or it is the whole sphere and the group is non-discrete. Parabolic elements generate a group where all orbits accumulate in one point. And loxodromic elements in the orbits accumulate at two points. Well, another example are the Fuchsian groups, which are those Kleinian groups where the set of accumulation points of the orbits is contained in a round circle. One has the quasi Fuchsian, Fuchsian groups where the accumulation points of the orbits is containing a quasi circle. That means a circle, a topological circle, which is a fractal curve. Let me say. 
And one has also Schottky groups, which are obtained by considering these joint circles in the sphere, and then it, uh, making inversions in, in them. Okay. So whenever one, one has a climbing group, the definition of its limit set is the set of accumulation points of the orbits. This is a closed invariant set, which is never vanishing unless the group is finite. And its complement is the region of this continuity. And these have very nice properties. I'm recalling all of these just because I'm to speak about it for later. So some examples. A Fuchsian group generated by on the size of a hyperbolic triangle. In this case, the limit set is the whole circle, which is the sphere at infinity of the unit disk. This is a called a kissing Schottky groups. We have a, a collection of circles forming like a collar with a common orthogonal circle C. Now, whenever you have make an inversion in one of the small circles, that leaves the circle C invariant because they meet orthogonally. So when you make iterate inversions, you start getting something like this. And then it's an exercise to see that the limit set is the whole circle. And every orbit is dense in the circle. Here are another similar things. But in this case, there is no common orthogonal circle. So the limit set we get is a quasi quasi circle. So these are called, uh, uh, well, these are quasi Fuchsian groups. Now, some properties, and I finish with this, is that the limit set, if it has finite cardinality, then it consists of one or at most two points. And the close, the, in that case, the group is called elementary. In general, every orbit in the limit set is dense, and all orbits accumulate in, in, in the whole limit set. So the limit set is a minimal set. And if we look at the complement, it can be empty or have one, two, or infinitely many components. So whenever you have a Kleinian group acting on the sphere, it is split the set, the sphere two invariant sets, the limit set and the region of this continuity. The, the dynamics concentrates in the limit set. The region of this continuity is very interesting to, for geometry. There's a lot more to say, but this is all I, I will say. Now let me move into higher dimensions. And let me say that almost all of my talk will be implicit in the previous beautiful talk we heard by Bill Goldman. And if you attended that lecture, you will see that Ravi's work permeates everything I'm going to say. Now, uh, as he pointed out, there are very various notions of limit set and Ravi investigated that. The point is that when you are working on P1 or on S2, holomorphic is the same as conformal. And that has a very rich, uh, strong richness. And then essentially all concepts of limit set coincide in that situation, but that's very special. When you go into higher dimensional projective spaces, there is not such a well-defined concept of, of limit set. And then, there is one such concept, or several concepts into, which make up one introduced by Ravis. This was mentioned in the previous talk, which in our setting has proved to be extremely interesting, extremely important. Before you enter into that, let me give you some families of examples of projective groups in higher, in other, in higher dimensions, which shows that it is a very, very interesting topic. Well, the play first is, of course, complex hyperbolic and complex affine groups. These are some groups of the projective group. So and that's, those are extremely rich areas. I will say more about each of these in a moment. One also has complex Schottky groups, and one has groups obtained by the, the twister theory. Let me say a, a few words about each of these. Complex Schottky groups. The first such groups constructed to my knowledge, were done, was done by Nori in order to construct. Uh, th these groups will have a region where, where the group acts properly is continuous, and the quotient was a compact complex manifold with a rich structure. The construction I will give is different to Nori's one, somehow similar but different. This is this was done with Alberto Verkowski, 
And that's how we start into this area. And okay. let me recall that in for classical Schottky groups, we use circles in S2 as mirrors. Each circle splits this field into two pieces, which are interchanged by an evolution. Here, let me do it. One can do it in all odd dimensional projective spaces. I will do it in P3. And what we do is to construct mirrors and use those mirrors to construct discrete groups. So notice that if you have two project, disjoint projective lines in P3, this corresponds to two planes through the origin in C4. And it's easy to find a linear automorphism interchanging those planes. That means that we have projective maps, many projective maps interchanging the lines L and K. Now, if we look at uh, the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of one of them, then these maps, inter I mean, there is a map interchanging the interior of the, that neighborhood with the exterior. So the, the boundary plays the role of a mirror. Okay. So now we are going to take a finite collection. Well, here we take a finite collection of lines, of pairs of lines, if you want, and we take a very, very thin mirror about one of them in each pair, and we look at the group generated by them. Then we show that uh, these groups are discrete if we choose the mirrors thin enough. And uh, you have a very rich dynamics. If you look, look at the set of accumulation points of the, of the lines, what you get is a Cantor set times S1, S2. And you can make a kind of a rich theory, a theory, looking at the formations of the group versus the formations of the complex manifold you get as quotient from the region of this continuity. And well, it's a very, very interesting question. Where is the theorem? But I already said it. So let me move to a second example, which is complex hyperbolic groups already appeared in the previous lecture. So in projective space, we can consider the unit ball of points whose homogeneous coordinates satisfy that equation, in equation. That defines a ball in Pn. It serves as model for hyper hyperbolic space. And PUN1 serves as group of holomorphic isometries. And uh, in this setting, one can work as a notion of limit set defined by Chern and Greenberg. In the classical way, one looks at the points in the complex hyperbolic space. If you have a, a group acting, you, let the, you look at the orbits, all orbits accumulate in the sphere at infinity. And that is the Chern Greenberg limit set. That has very nice dynamical properties similar to the classical limit set. And uh, well, <clears throat> But the problem is that the, this set is not really looking at what happens outside the unit ball in projective space. If you want to see what happens, a much more useful is the radical Carney's limit set, which is uh, the union, by definition, the union of three sets. The first of one is the one mentioned by Bill in his previous lecture. No, that, that, this is the second. If the first of them is a uh, this, the closure of the set of points with infinite isotropy. Then you look at points in the complement of that set and you look at the uh, where they accumulate and you look at the closure, that is L1. And finally, you look at, you remove L0 and L1 and you look at compact sets in the complement. You look at where the points accumulate and that is L2. And the union of the three of them gives you a limit set, which a priori one could say, what is the use of it? Well, uh, Ravi in his paper, uh, groups with a domain of discontinuity introduces this concept and he does very, very, very interesting things with it. Let me say uh, that one, one nice property to start is that the action on the complement is properly discontinuous. And in our setting, I will say a lot more. For example, this, if you have a discrete subgroup of PSL n plus one C, which is infinite, then it's called Carney limit set, always contains at least one projective line. Well, the action on the complement is properly discontinued, that's always. And the complement also contains the region of equicontinuity. 
And one can prove that moreover, moreover if the group is complex hyperbolic, then the Kolkarni limit set is the union of all complex projecting hyperplanes tangent to the boundary, which is here, the boundary of the unit ball, at points at the chain Greenberg limit set. So you get a very nice description. And then in, that, in this case, the complement, the Kolkarni's region of discontinuity is actually equal to the discontinuity, equicontinuity region, and it is the largest set where the action is properly discontinuous. And if we further require that the group be co-compact, that means that uh, the quotient of the hyperbolic space by the group is a compact orbifold, then the current limit set actually is determined by the, sorry, is L0 union L1 by the orbits of, of points, and it is the whole complement of the hyperbolic sphere. So there's a lot more about to say about complex hyperbolic geometry. I refer to the literature and to Bill Goldman's book, and there's a vast literature. Just, now let me move to the third example, which is kind of groups of 10 by via two theory. This is something I did with Alberto Verkowski. Two theory was introduced by Penrose, and is one of the jewels of last century mathematics. The starting point is the rich interplay between conformal geometry in the basis space and the holomorphic structure in the complex uh, pistol space. I'll do it only for S4. The two-story space is by definition, the total space of the fiber bundle over S4 with fiber at each point, the set of all complex structures on the tangent space, which are compatible with the metric and the orientation. Then it's not easy, it's not trivial, it's well known that the, the fiber turns out to be P1C or S2, and the twister space itself, it turns out to be the projective space P3. So one has a P3 fibers over S4 with fiber S2. That is known as the Calabi vibration, also the Pendle vibration or the twister vibration. And uh, moreover, the conformal, the group of conformal automorphisms of the four sphere has a canonical embedding into PSL4C. One way to see that is uh, following Alfors and show that uh, every conformal automorphism of the four spheres can be regarded as a Mobius transformation with quaternionic coefficients. Then one has a canonical, so, so one, one has a lifting of the conformal group in S4 has a canonical lifting to a group of automorphisms in P3. And then we show this in an exercise that those automorphisms in P3 are taking twister lines into twister lines, but it sees by isometries in the lines. So in P3, you have conformal transformations are conformal in the horizontal direction and isometries on the fibers. And that has important consequence on the limit set. We prove that you have any discrete subgroup in S4, of conformal automorphisms in S4, and you take its lifting, gamma twiddle, and you look at the Kolkarni limit set in the twister space, then that limit set is just the inverse image on the for projection map of the limit set in S4. And so also with the region of discontinuity. So in particular, if the limit set of the group is the whole S4, then the limit set upstairs in, in P3 is the whole P3. Otherwise, it is just a product. And so it's interesting that uh, this is showing that this conformal dynamics actually embeds in, into holomorphic di dynamics. And in, the, in, the, in, in this the holomorphic se setting, you can see more. If you start with a group of conformal, let me say of isometries of the hyperbolic fiber space, but which is contained in a, in a group of uh, isometries in the smaller dim in the dimension is less than four, then the action on the limit set is not minimal. While if the group is uh, sufficiently big, then the action is minimal. In particular, one gets that the fundamental group of every hyperbolic five manifold acts minimally on P3. Okay, so now those were examples 
No, let, let me try to start making a more systematic study. This is something I've been doing with these people with uh, Barrera, Cano, and Navarrete, and more people. Those are the main names. And, uh, and we have a few things in higher dimensions. Let me focus on complex dimension two. If you have a discrete group in PSL3C, then we can prove that the limit set always contains at least a projective line, that's always. But in this case, if it contains at least two lines, then the limit set is connected and it is a union of lines. Second, the number of lines in this limit set is either one, two, three, or infinite. Now, you can look at lines, in, in, you can ask is, if the lines are in general position or not. For example, we have, exa we have examples where the limit set has infinitely many lines, but they, form, they are forming a cone with a point in common and parametrized by a circle, by a copy of RP1 embedded in, RP, in CP1, in, in, in CP2. So in that case, you have infinitely many lines in the limit set, but all of them are passing through the same point. So we have only two, only two of them are in general position. General position means that if you have a set of lines, not three of them intersect. So if we look, look at, limit, limit, at lines in the limit set, which are in general position, there can be one, two, three, or four. And if you have more than four lines in, in, in general position, then you have infinitely many lines. Now the number of isolated points in the Kulkarni limit set is at most one. And if there is one such point, then the limit set, set consists of one line and one point. There cannot be no more points. And just uh, finally some remark because it's not a theorem. Uh, if we look, we look at the complement, we have examples where the region of this continuity is empty when the limit set is everything, or it has one connected component, two components, three components, four components, and infinitely many components. Let me recall that in, in, in P1, the equivalent statement would be that it, can, it, is, it can be empty, have one or two connected components, and if it has more than two, then it has infinitely many components. That's a theorem. In our case, we know this, but we do not know if there are other examples with five, seven, whatever number of components. Now, recall also that we have the Poincare classification of the elements in PSL2C that I described as elliptic, parabolic, and loxodromic. Then the same definition extends to higher dimensions. And well, the extension I'm going to read coincides with the well known extensions in the complex hyperbolic case and other generalizations given by John Parker, Krishnendu, and others. So the definition is if you have, let, let me focus in P3, in P2, so in PSL3C, we will say that if an element is elliptic, if it has a lifting to SL3C, which is diagonalizable with eigenvalues of norm one. The element is parabolic if it has a lifting, which is non-diagonalizable and the eigenvalues are one. And it is loxodromic if it has an eigenvalues of norm different to one, okay? So for a, a thorough discussion of this, you, you can look at the paper we wrote for the Ravi 70 very brain meeting in Almora, long ago. And then one is the previous definition can be given dynamically. This is very beautiful. Remember in, in the elliptic case, G was, if G was elliptic, see if and only if the limit set was either empty or the whole sphere. Here the limit set, if the, the, the transformation is elliptic, if the limit set is empty or the whole P2. In P1, G was parabolic if it had only one fixed point or one point in its limit set. Here G is parabolic if its limit set is one line. And G was loxodromic in, in, when you were acting on S2, loxodromic meant that the limit set consisted of two points. Here, the limit set consists of two projectives to the spaces, which can be two lines 
or one line and one point. So we see that this limit set gives us a very beautiful generalization. And this generalizes to all dimensions in an, just like this, is it a direct generalization to all dimensions. Now, let me mention that there's another very interesting concept of limit set introduced by Conce and Givarch in 2000, uh, studying groups of linear transformations in RD and trying to study to describe the orbit closures. So that's related to work done by uh, Danny and, and many others. In the particular case of subgroups of PSL3C, uh, they, for, for, them, for them to have that defining work, they need some conditions. If you restrict to PSL3C, that set can be defined in a full generality. We, it can be said, said as follows. This definition only applies in PSL3C. Right? And we say that a, a point Q in P2 is a limit point of G of the group if there is an open neighborhood of, of Q so that every point or every point here, I mean, there's a sequence of, uh, the, the, sorry, there's a sequence of elements in the group taking the whole neighborhood into Q. So every point in the neighborhood accumulates in Q. So in that sense, in that case, we say that Q is a limit point of the group. And then the concept of large limit set can be defined as the closure of all limit points in G. So we have this theorem. Uh, this has been improved uh, by these authors in different parts. Some of them proved the part, and other pro others proved another part, and so on. I let me put it together. If the group is discrete and its limit set contains at least four lines, this can be weakened in some conditions. I put this restriction to make it in a, in a uniform uh, setting. So if the limit set contains four lines in general position, then the limit set is a closure, is the closure of the invariant lines of loxodromic elements. Its complement coincides with the equicontinuity region, and it is always the largest region where the group acts properly discontinuous. If you look, we look at the closure of invariant lines regarded in the projective dual space, it is the unique minimal set for the action, and it coincides with the concept of large limit set regarded in the dual projective space. And finally, the complement of the limit set, this region of discontinuity, is a complete Kobayashi hyperbolic space. So when the limit set has enough lines, so to say, we have a uniform behavior. We can actually have the, we actually have the first items in a Sullivan's type dictionary between climate groups and iteration theory. That will be published soon. Uh, we are finishing it. So we have lately been studying the delicate cases when the limit set has few lines. If we call these elementary groups. I will come to that in a moment, in a few moments. Before that, let me move for a moment into geometry in dimension two. So we consider uh, first some notions that were already explained before by Bill Goldman in a much better way. Let's just recall in case somebody wasn't in his lecture and so and doesn't know this. If we have a, a manifold M, we, have, we say that it has a GL, GX structure. If it has a maximal class by coding the charts with values in X and where the local changes of coordinates are restrictions of elements in G. So M is locally modeled on X and the blue maps are all restrictions of maps in G. Some examples, there are many examples I mentioned three that were already mentioned, which, which are relevant for what follows. Where one has complex affine structures by looking at the affine group. One also has complex hyperbolic structures, and one can also speak of complex projective structures. And since the affine group and the complex hyperbolic group PVUN1 are contained in PSLN plus 1C, any of the two previous structures are particular cases of projective structures. We, let me mention one important theorem, which says that in the particular case 
of dimension two and compact manifolds, the converse is true. That's a theorem by Kobayashi and Ochi in 81. And so if we have a compact complex surface with a projective structure, then M is either complex hyperbolic or complex affine. Okay. So having this in mind, let me look at this following situation. So we, we want to look at discrete groups in PSL3C acting on P2 in such a way that there's an open invariant set where the action is properly discontinuous and the quotient is compact. When that happens, we say that the group is quasi-co-compact. Quasi so quasi-co-compact means there is an open invariant set where the action is properly discontinuous and the quotient is compact. <coughs> Before we continue, let me say that uh, we say that uh, a discrete group is elementary of type one if the concurrent limit set has at most three lines. You remember, I say that uh, if it has more than three lines, it has more infinite limit lines. So elementary means it has at most three lines. And type one means that we're only looking at lines. We're not talking about lines in general position. I'll come to that later. So together with, uh, with Kano, Angel Kano, who was my former student, now is my teacher. If we have a quasi-co-compact group, then the group is either elementary, type one, affine, or hyperbolic. So we are bringing to, this, to the group to the level of groups the theorem of Kobayashi and Ochiai. And then the next question is: which open sets appear in CP2 as larger sets where some group acts properly discontinuously with compact quotient? And then we classify those, the possible open sets, all our concurrent limit sets, concurrent regions of discontinuity. And the possibilities are the whole P2, if you group it, and then the group is a, a final group, or the complex hyperbolic group, complex hyperbolic space, or P2 minus one line, P2 minus one line on one point, P2 minus two lines, P2 minus three lines, which are the limit sets of the elementary groups I mentioned before, or C star times H plus union H minus, where this denote the upper and lower half spaces in C, or V times C star, where D is an open set in the Riemann sphere, whose universal cover is the hyperbolic plane. So those are the only open sets that appear as largest sets where the action, where some group acts properly discontinuously with compact quotient. And then having that, we were able to classify the compact orifolds, orbifolds that arise. I will, to, to give this clear classification, let me just recall something which are well known to all of you or to most of you. And uh, let me recall that a hop surface is a quotient of C2 by a free action of a discrete group. A complex in our surface is a quotient of C times the hyperbolic plane by a solvable group. An elliptic surface means that you have a proper morphism of an, over an algebraic curve so that the, the fibers are connected and the generic fibers have genus one to so their elliptic surfaces, elliptic curves. And a primary codial surface means the surface has codira dimension zero, odd Betty number, that means it's a codira surface, and trivial canonical bondu, as where the primary comes. And then we have this theorem, which I just make you give it in a very summarized way. Uh, one can say a lot more, one can describe it. We describe the developing mappings, we describe we much more information. But if you have a, co a, a compact quotient, uh, or, or before with a projective structure, then it is either of the, of the, of the form P2 over C divided by the group where the group is a finite group, or is a complex hyperbolic manifold, or is complex affine, and we say which type 
of, of, of a fine surface appear. It has to be an innovative surface, we, we say when, or a complex chloride, or a hop surface, or a primary color surface, or an elliptic applied surface. Okay, so now let me move to the last issue I want to talk, which is the classification of the elementary groups. So for final subgroups in PSL2C uh, or PUN1, we know that if the limit set has final cardinality, then it has at most two points. And then the group is defined to be elementary. In our setting, as I said, we have two notions of elementary. One is that the limit set has finite elementary lines. The other is that the limit set has finitely many lines in general position. So the classification of uh, elementary groups is being gradually done by th these guys. They have been working for some years. And this is, there is already a full classification of, a, of uh, the, those groups having exactly one line, in the limit set. Also full classification of the groups having four lines in general position. And the classification of the cases with two and three lines is almost complete now. And that uh, this classification passes through an essential step for completing that is something we have already done, which is classifying the purely parabolic discrete groups to PSL3C. That means groups such that uh, away from the identity, all the elements are parabolic transformations. This is a paper we have finished recently. And uh, we classify the purely parabolic discrete groups into five families. The first is the, what we call elliptic groups. These are the only ones which are not conjugate to subgroups of the Heisenberg group. And these are fundamental, the main cause from the fact that they are subgroups of fundamental groups of elliptic surfaces. Then we have the torus groups. These are subgroups of fundamental groups of the complex toroid. Or dual uh, torus groups. Uh, I don't want to explain the duality now, but uh, this, is, this is a very simple duality. And uh, this is a very rich family because this family, the family of dual torus groups, is split into three types. The first type has limit set one projective line. The second type has limit set a cone of lines over a circle. Or, or, or over a real projective one dimensional space. And the third class has limit set the whole P2. And uh, in general, one corollary of what we do is to show that all that the limit set of purely parabolic groups is of one of these three types either one line or a cone of lines over a real projective space of dimension one or the whole P2. Those are the only possibilities for purely parabolic groups. Then we have the family of Inoue groups of two types. The first are proper subgroups of fundamental groups of Inoue surfaces. And the second type are extensions of those groups. And then we have the richest of all, which are the Kodaira groups, which are the abelian Kodaira groups are fundamental groups of Kodaira surfaces. And they split into, there are five types of different extensions of this. Two of them have limit set one cone of light of lines over a projective space, and the other three have limit set the whole P2. And uh, well, just a few words. A key step for the classification is proving first that all purely parabolic discrete groups are conjugate to upper triangular groups, and therefore they act on projective space with a global fixed point. Then Whenever you, are, you have a group acting in P2 with a fixed point P, then a choice of a line outside P determines a, project, a canonical holomorphic projection from P2 minus P into L, which is a projection you will do. Well, and uh, so once you have this projection, you have a, uh, 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 it induces a group morphism from gamma into PSL to C that we call the control morphism. 
and it's in a chip called the control group. And the, the names come because these, they allow you to control very much the dynamics of the group by looking at the control morphism, at the kernel of the control morphism, and the image of the control morphism, which is a discrete subgroup in TPSL2C. So you're reducing the dynamics in three dimensions to a dynamics in two dimensions. The price you pay is that in PSL2C, the group you get may not be discrete. Okay, then we have to make a deep study of non-discrete subgroups in PSL2C. And then, well, there's a lot more that could be said, but I think this is a good place to stop. And thank you very much. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Joe Jose. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ravi. You have talked so much. You have been such a no, I, in Mexico, and so yeah, yeah I think you yeah, developed the subject so beautifully. Yeah. Do, do, do do you use uh, computers in your work? Yes, very much. Ah, uh, and you have a large group of people working on this. That's that's great. Uh, uh, how is Alberto? Yeah, Alberto is very well, thanks. Very uh, well. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much for the nice talk, Prof. Cecilia. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you. And now I would like to ask the participants if there are any questions. Professor Bill Goldman, yeah, you want to ask something? Yeah, sure. Professor Goldman can ask. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ah. So Pepe. Yes. Yeah. So so I, I mean I missed some of the talks. Okay. Uh, but I think you are looking at three kind of limit sets, right? One is the Sorry, can you, can you repeat? You think I was looking at what? No, no, you are looking at three kind of limit sets. Yes. Right. So one is the chain Greenberg, one is the Kulkarni limit set, and the other is uh, oh, another. Uh -huh. So now, corresponding to the three limit sets, you are getting three domain of discontinuity. Yes. So is, is it known how they are related? Yes. Uh, in the case of CP2, we have a, a complete description of them, uh, the way they, they relate. So one is uh, contained in the other? The, the, the usual limit set only applies when you are considering complex hyperbolic groups, essentially. Yes. Yes. And then in that case, we have the complete description of its relation with the Kulkarni limit set. I see. That in, in, in that we have it in all dimensions, not only in P2. I, I, I described it in P2, but that we have it in all dimensions. Okay. Uh, we, we, the relation with the concept of Arch limit set, we have it in dimension two. Okay. So and in fact, there's a th there's a one more line, one more concept that I didn't define now, which in dimension two brings nothing new. In higher dimensions, it does. Which is obtained by the Cartan decomposition theorem. Using oh. that, well, one has a uh, different notion of limit set, which in higher dimensions, say higher higher than two, is uh, is a very interesting set. Acha. Okay. Okay. Now, now, but my another question I want to ask is that, uh, in for example, in SL two C. Yeah. So this Kulkarni limit set and chain Greenberg limit set, are they equivalent or? Yeah, it, it, it is the same. The Kulkarni limit set coincides with the usual limit set. Okay. And what about, uh, do you know what about SL2H, the two by two matrices over uh, quarter million? Uh, uh, so that acts as the uh, isometric group of the hyperbolic four space or five space, yes. real hyperbolic. Okay. Yes. So now they are, uh, do you know what is the, whether one, uh, relation? 
Uh, yeah, truly speaking, I have never worked on that. We, we have never worked on that. I could try to say some very simple things, but I essentially know nothing. Okay. Nothing that is worth saying. No, but my, my question is that when you look at, say, limit set of SL2H. Yes. You will look on HP2, right? Yes. HP2. But there, yeah. I think it, it is not the, uh, it is not the, it is the real hyperbolic space, right? Or the one-dimensional quaternionic hyperbolic space. I mean, they are sort of the same thing. Okay. So, so it is over reals in this case. But in your study, you have mostly over complex numbers. Yes. Correct. Now, now, what is the corresponding picture of a real number? For example, if you take SL3R action on RP2, uh, what is the relation between these limits? Mm -hmm. SL3R action yes. on RP2. Yeah. I, mean, uh, I don't have a uh, good answer. No, so, uh, yeah. so for, for, for example. No, what I'm trying to, I mean, I'm looking at this recently and what I'm trying to understand that what is the special about complex number that you are uh, sort of looking at the complex Kleinian group, even though the real Kleinian groups are, uh, I, mean, I mean, the higher dimensional, I don't know, I mean, maybe those are related to this uh, other theories like, convex structure or that, I mean, that I cannot say, but for the limit set is concerned, I mean, one can look into no. SLC or action or RP2, right, and ask the same question. No, no, I mean, this answer I can tell you, I mean, why? Is, uh, is Bill still around? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah Bill. I think uh, uh, Bill, Bill can answer this. <laughs> yes, I, I'm sure Bill, Bill knows a lot more than I about this, I, far more. Well, I'm not sure. I, yeah. I, I think mean, sometimes you have to go up to the flag manifold. Yeah, yeah I'm not. I, yeah. I, I mean, I think this is the work I mentioned of um, Guichard mm -hmm. and, and Beinhart for parabolic homogeneous spaces. Okay. But, um, it, you sometimes. It depends a lot. It seems to be sensitive to the parabolic element, the isotropy group. And sometimes you have to remove larger, like on RP2, you have a limit set, which is a, a circle, but it, it makes more sense to go up to the flag manifold instead of the three manifold, where you get a domain of disc, you get several domains of discontinuity. Okay. But offhand, I don't know the answer. So, uh, uh, just let me add that why we were considered in the complex case? Yeah. Because we were, we, because we were coming from uh, holomorphic dynamics and uh, many of our inspirations and some come, come from holomorphic dynamics. I see. But uh, no doubt the real case should be very interesting, perhaps even more interesting, as Bill knows very well. And uh, the quaternionic case should also be interesting. Okay. Are there any more questions? questions? So there are no questions. Let's thank the speaker again. Oh, thank you. So next talk.